My name is Mary Dinsmore and I'm a faculty member here at the School of Environmental Sustainability. I, along with my colleague, Dr. Debjani Gaddick, um, will be moderating the panel today. We'd also like to thank Dr. John Lee, um, who also helped uh, formulate this panel, but unfortunately could not be here today. Our conversation today will begin with each of our panelists giving a brief 10 minute introduction of their work and their knowledge base. Um, and we will follow with a robust discussion and invitation from the audience for questions that will follow. We will begin today with Dr. Jonas Jägermeier. Dr. Jägermeier is a climate change scientist and crop modeler. He focuses on food systems and security at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Please welcome Dr. Jägermeier to the podium. So I, what I thought doing is share a couple of insights from, from my own work and like frame the general challenge and then encourage you all to have questions and go more into an interactive discussion. I think that's more fun. So uh, let's see how we advance. Um, agriculture. Okay, we're here. How to feed the world in the future without destroying the planet. We have three really major challenges. We need to produce more food and nutritional food. Um, we need to do that sustainably and scale back the massive environmental footprint of agriculture. And then there's climate change. Agriculture is a really hard challenge, a really hard sector to decarbonize. And also it poses challenges for food production systems. Uh, and that's basically my bread and butter. And I want to share some of the insights on climate change and all of the other challenges that make this uh, a really non-trivial challenge. We need to discuss them with you all. Um, so he, real quick to kick us off, this is, this is just an example, how we use, how we leverage computer modeling. So we're setting up crop models informed by remote sensing um, to really understand the system, to understand what the processes are and to look deep uh, uh, and, and uh, simulate uh, agroecosystems around the world. And then we can use these systems to evaluate future impacts and potentially uh, figure out pathways that can be more sustainable. So this fun acronym, AGMIP, the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project, we say it once and then we only say AGMIP, <laughs> is a community of a thousand plus people who are all concerned with agriculture, with climate change, and modeling in the larger sense. So we have this flower diagram with all these different activities, we're all doing different things, but the main challenge is translating climate sciences into impacts, into societal impacts. So climate impact science is the problem here. And in fact, the uncertainties here are actually much larger than the climate sciences. So you run your climate model and tells us how temperature and precipitation is changing, but then what does it mean for us on the field is the big challenge. And I lead the Global Crop, crop Modeling Initiative in AGMAP. So we're running all these different crop models on supercomputers, process-based crop models that know all these different processes and biophysical understanding of the system to try to figure out how future uh, uh, climate change scenarios may impact food systems uh, down the road. So this is a high-level aggregate of, of recent work, um, an ensemble of 12 crop models, different climate models uh, running over the course of the century. And as, you, as timeline evolves, you see there are, there are creeping in major changes across bread baskets globally. You know, for maize, lower left and wheat, top right, you start recognizing geographical pattern, but also stark differences between the crops itself. And that's associated with uh, different responses to drought and temperature. Um, but mainly to CO2 changes too. So wheat is, uh, can benefit much more from higher CO2 levels in the atmosphere than maize does. But it's also important to realize where each crop is grown. So wheat usually grown at higher latitudes can benefit or suffers less from uh, uh, adverse climate change impacts where maize is traditionally grown at lower latitudes um, than wheat um, facing uh, the largest impacts. So this is the overarching message. What's not really clear from these maps is that the latitudinal profile, now averaging different latitudinal bands, uh, 
highlights that the largest changes actually occur uh, in the global south in lower latitudes, and that's the same pattern across different crops. One of the most robust conclusions from, from, from this kind of work uh, that, that we need to be aware of. Um, it, one metric that we like to look at this problem is, is the time of climate impact emergence. And that's a nice way to frame it because it's a risk perspective. It says, when does the mean signal leave the historical envelope of uncertainty or variability? You know, the, the bold line, when does it leave the envelope of the dashed line? And that's the occurrence, that's the new norm. When a system state really uh, reaches a new level, that's important. So think of a 10% change in one region that's very variable in history, doesn't mean the same thing as 10% change in a very stable system. So this research shows that the time of emergence is actually pretty much around the corner, uh, happening much, soon, much sooner than, than we thought. We can aggregate that over the entire global maize production regions and come up with a figure that's pretty scary. Actually, 74% um, of global cultivated maize um, uh, shows that kind of signal. For wheat, we are speaking of positive emergence because at global level, uh, wheat is uh, expected to see gains under moderate climate change, and that's a message we need to get comfortable with. It's not an easy conversation to have. There, there may be winners and losers of climate change, but it's important to realize that too. Now, mean change is only one thing. You know, end of century. Who cares about 50 years down the line? What farmers really, uh, and insurances and stakeholders are really uh, interested in is uh, shorter lead times. What happens at the end of the season? What happens in five years, 10 years? So what these mean changes hide is that there's an increase in interannual variability, in, in volatility. So the system becomes more uh, variable, even though mean changes may go up or down. So this figure shows that for maize, we saw big declines on average. For wheat, increases. But the underlying system becomes more variable. And that can put farmers out of business. That can impact prices, destabilize the food system. And the maps show that across most major breadbasket regions, we're expecting a higher volatility in the system. Now, it's important to realize that all of the stuff I've talked about before don't include adaptation. There's a lot we can do to buffer some of these negative impacts, but deliberately we're trying to exclude that because we want to understand the system. We want to unpack, see what the processes are, understand, and then we talk about adaptation. So there's a lot, there's a lot we can do. Um, this is one example on uh, planting dates and cultivar adaptation. So if you're shifting the growing season using cultivars that exploit a new climate regime uh, better, can buffer some of these impacts. But the map highlights, in blue shades, we're seeing higher adaptation capacity, darker shades less so. The same problem, the global south has a lower adaptation capacity than the global north, facing the brunt of the impacts. Now, on my last slide, I want to highlight another aspect that's often overlooked. Looking at yield, productivity, how much harvest do we get of the field is important to feed the world, but yield isn't equally, isn't, isn't the only thing. So the, the nutritional quality of the crop that we're getting is really important, and we all need protein and micronutrients such as uh, zinc, iron, and vitamins, and the models in line with field experiments show that climate change driven by higher greenhouse gas emissions, and especially uh, CO2 concentrations, um, reduce the nutritional quality of crops, especially wheat and rice that are sensitive to CO2 increases, which levels or offsets these gains we potentially saw. So uh, climate change reduces the nutritional quality of crops, um, affecting uh, 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 global uh, nutrition. So my overarching three take-home messages here is climate change is more pronounced, is stronger, and emerges earlier than previously thought. 
um, again, there will be winners and losers, um, but pretty much every breadbasket around the world is expected to see fundamental changes. And that needs, we need adaptation, and even in positive uh, cases, we need, we need ways to harness these. Uh, the adverse impacts are largely located in lower latitudes, which means a disproportional effect on uh, 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 countries that uh, don't have the same adaptation capacity in many uh, cases, which directly affects livelihoods um, much more than developed breadbaskets in the global north. Um, and then lastly, climate change also affects protein content and nutritional quality. Um, there's a dilution effect, so we may have a higher yield, but the, the, uh, the actual nutritional quality we get of the field uh, may be compromised, and um, that uh, affects uh, uh, global uh, nutrition challenges. All right, I'll leave it with that, and I'm, again, I encourage you to ask questions, and let's discuss any of that. Um, thanks, for, thanks for that. Our second panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Obudu Nebi. Dr. Nebi is an assistant professor at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change and the Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science at Arizona State University. Her work focuses on the interactions between climate adaptations and food and water insecurity, primarily in the Sahel region of West, Af excuse me, West Africa. Please welcome Dr. Nebi to the podium. Hello everyone, it's really great to be here today. So I would like to start my presentation with a little story. Can you all see me? OK. <laughs> so I would like to start my presentation with a little story um, that shows the severity of food insecurity in the global south, and more precisely in the Sahel region of West Africa, where I grew up and where I conduct most of my research as an anthropologist. Thank you. <laughs> So this is the story of Mbaswamba the hare and Bakatre the Aina. And in that story, it is said that the Aina and the hare, they were friends and they were living in the same village where there was a big famine. So nobody had anything to eat. So the hare, very wise, told the Aina that each of them should sell their mothers in order to buy food. Of course, this is just a tale, and nobody will go to the extent of selling their mothers to buy food, at least not now. Um, but this story really illustrates um, the everyday lives that people in the Sahel region have taken, um, the everyday life of people in the Sahel region who have taken extreme measures in bad rainfall years. And such extreme measures include selling of their livestock or any other productive assets that they have, relying on informal networks, um, extended family, friends, and neighbors to get food, or earning income from gold mining or wage labor in cities. As anthropologists, because I'm an anthropologist, uh, we use this type of stories to understand the cultural dimensions of food security uh, for rural producers who are already dealing with uh, the impacts of climate change. And um, this is a daily struggle, and we are trying to find innovative strategies to adapt to those. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Sahel region, um, the Sahel is this transitional zone that you see here in red between the Sahara Desert in the north and the more humid coast of Africa in the south. And due to its location, as you imagine, it's a semi-arid region, and um, it's known as one of the harshest production settings in the world. And in this region, people rely on rain-fed agriculture and livestock raising for their subsistence. And the type of crops that they raise are so Gum, millet, um, maize, and also groundnuts, cowpeas, etc. So rainwater is the major source of water that they have for food production, and most farmers there cannot afford irrigation systems. But getting that water is a major problem nowadays because climate change has translated into more erratic rainfall, um, a shorter rainy season with long drier spells and extreme heat. But water scarcity isn't the only issue in the Sahel. 
the frequency and the severity of flooding, as you can see here, is also rising. Um, and this has devastating impacts on livestock and crops. And unfortunately, these issues have been overlooked because of the historical focus on drought on, in the region. And I grew up in Burkina Faso, my home country, not even predicting that one day I would need to be good at swimming to survive field work there. And as you can see, this is becoming the new normal. And global warming and the changing rainfall patterns are also increasing the proliferation of agricultural pests in Africa, as you can see here with the desert locusts that invaded East Africa a few years ago. And this is leaving millions of people at risk of food insecurity. And all these issues that I talked about have increased the biodiversity loss, which affects soil, um, soil quality and the vegetation that livestock in the region relies on. And and here, I would like to pause a little bit and talk about livestock, because when we speak about food production in Africa, we need to consider livestock because it is a critical sector. And livestock farmers in the region do not just supply meat and dairy, pro, um, dairy, dairy products. They equally boost the agricultural sector, because they are the ones providing um, traction animals for farmers, and they are the ones providing manure so that farmers can grow healthy crops. Unfortunately, the contribution of the livestock sector has been underestimated, and food production um, in that sector is often put under the umbrella of agriculture, which does not help when it comes to differentiating the particular challenges that crop farmers and livestock farmers are experiencing. And livestock raising in West Africa is done outdoors, and it involves moving livestock from dry areas to humid areas in the dry season. So a rise in temperature will affect livestock but also the culture of traditional herders who are sedentary or nomad and, or, and nomadic. And uh, this will also have consequences for millions of people who are relying on that sector. Under the current climate projections, experts are warning that Africa might not be able to feed its own population by 2050. And by that time, the population will double. And predictions are that Africa will only be able to produce about 13% of its own food. But in northern Burkina Faso, historically known as a desertification hotspot and where I worked, uh, farmers say that the famines of the past could never happen again. And this is because they have invested in indigenous soil and water conservation um, strategies that are shown on these pictures. These innovations have been successful at preventing land degradation, reducing water runoff, and stimulating crop and pasture growth. So the food security that they experience um, nowadays is not se as severe as it used to be in the past. But for how long? Um, but not everyone in the region experienced the impacts of climate change and food insecurity the same way. There are differences based on gender, livelihood, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, etc. And as an anthropologist, I will walk through those. In a recent study, we found that even within the same household, husband and wives have different experiences with water insecurity, which coexist with food insecurity and could be a potential driver. And in herding households, men reported wa more water stress compared to their wives. And because, because be, they, they, they experience that because they are the ones moving livestock, in herding household, households, generally, the men are the ones moving livestock. And in West Africa, for example, they are experiencing xenophobia, and there is um, the rising uh, threat of extremist violence. So they have to take all those into consideration in times of climate change, which is even increasing the stress as they have to walk longer distance to secure pasture and water for the livestock. And these differences that we see within households between husband and wife, farmers and herders, suggest that we need to avoid generalizing findings even within the same household and move beyond a one-size-fits-all solution. Occasional droughts we found may have an impact on food and security in a specific year or in a specific season. But long-term food and security is likely mainly affected by structural issues such as economic constraints, conflict, 
poor transportation systems, distance from markets, among other issues. And this is why places such as Saffron Senegal experience more food insecurity, even though they receive good rainfall and they are relatively greener compared to other parts of the country. So this reminds us that climate change is just one pervasive issue that Africans have to deal with. Existing economic, political, social, and environmental issues also impact food production and access. Because of all these existing challenges, the impacts of climate change are more devastating for marginalized communities already under stress. In Senegal, we found that households involved in climate-sensitive activities such as agriculture, pastoralism, and fisheries with very few alternatives to obtain cash and buy food from the market in times of shock experienced more water insecurity. This means that while we are working to strengthen resilience, it is essential to pay particular attention to different livelihood groups, including poorly studied livestock farmers in West Africa who take a longer time to recover from droughts compared to crop farmers. And we found that livestock farmers actually remained food insecure for up to two years after a drought, while crop farmers returned to pre-drought food security levels in about 12 months. So I want to conclude by adding that the farmers that I work with to, to like right now are using their local indigenous knowledge to make very rational decisions, including soil and water conservation, and also ecological indicators such as birds to inform their, their decision um, regarding migration. And um, this helps them determine the timing and the quality of the coming rainy season. And this is knowledge that could be further explored in interdisciplinary climate research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nebi, uh, for very much giving those great examples of what Dr. Jägermeier had mentioned about the disproportionate effects in the global south compared to the global north. We are going to continue our conversation today with our third panelist, Dr. Asher Siebert. He's an applied climate scientist with a background in climate extreme scenario analysis, seasonal climate forecasting, index insurance, and forecast-based ba forecast financing for early humanitarian response to natural disasters, particularly in Africa. Please welcome Dr. Siebert. Thank you. Um, and just as a comment, um, uh, Dr. Nebi and I used to be colleagues at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society uh, at Columbia University in New York. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, the, the talk here uh, today is on seasonal forecasting and innovative financing for food security. Um, and here's my, my information um, if you'd like to contact me afterwards. So just to touch on a few global points that uh, were already mentioned by Dr. Jägermeier. Uh, we see very clearly in climate science that uh, as, as the climate changes, we have in, an increase in, in heat extremes, an increase in drought, and an increase in, um, in flooding events and heavy rainfall. And this all has a pathway of impact on agriculture and food security through uh, losses or, or, or reductions in, in harvest and yield, um, through mechanisms like erosion and soil nutrient loss and increasing water stress, um, and also through fire, fire risk, as we've seen here in, in North America in recent years. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Nibi also mentioned the, uh, the major locust invasion uh, in, in East Africa that also spread into to Southwest Asia in 2020 as a result of, of heavy rainfall. Um, one of the metrics that is sometimes used to measure the accumulated uh, water stress is something called WRSI, or Water Requirement Satisfaction Index. And some of the work that I was involved with in at IRI made a, um, a forecast of the, the WRSI in, in Rwanda. So that's uh, the, top, the top middle uh, image here. Um, as Dr. Jägermeier alluded to, um, there's also a lot of research in the field that indicates that the nutrient uh, density of major cereal crops is likely to change as the climate changes. And this um, image on the, the lower left is uh, from the literature, and it's a sort of error bars uh, around projected changes in, in different uh, nutrients uh, as a function of, of climate change for, for major cereal crops. But another pathway 
um, of, of impact is through, uh, through economics and, and impacts on markets. Uh, so in, in geography, uh, there's a, a narrative called the double exposure narrative where um, populations around the world that are vulnerable to the, the negative consequences of, clim of, of capitalism are also often very vulnerable to the negative consequences of climate change. And, and we see that in the, the, the impact on the, the global south. Um, and when there are major supply issues, there are also uh, price spike issues, either directly with commodities or passed on through um, impacts on, on the energy price. Um, and the, the image on the lower right here is um, the, the El Nino-La Nina pattern, the sea surface temperature anomaly, uh, as compared to the FAO Food and Agriculture Organization uh, price index. Um, so to talk a little bit about seasonal forecasting, uh, when, when scientists can produce a reliable, timely seasonal forecast um, in advance and, and disseminate it well, um, that can help advise important agricultural and food security decisions, such as which crop varieties to plant, when, what inputs to buy, and how to approach uh, financing. Uh, the image here on the, the top right is from um, some of my and my colleagues' work in Ethiopia. Um, so we made forecasts not just of the seasonal total rainfall, but also of the, the onset date or the date of the, the germinating rains within the season. Um, so that's what's shown here. Um, but there are a lot of challenges to um, both producing seasonal forecasts and getting those seasonal forecasts to affected populations. There's a spectrum of climate variability from the long term to the decadal to the interannual to the subseasonal. Uh, there are a lot of data limitations in, in many places where I've worked in, in Africa. Um, there are dissemination challenges. Not everyone, especially in, in developing countries, has access to the internet. Uh, so there are issues of, of conveying the information to rural environments, translating the information into local languages. Um, but at IRI, much of the work that <clears throat> was done was done through a multi-model ensemble statistical approach. And there was this focus on trying to understand seasonal rainfall totals, but also things like dry spell risk, onset date. Um, and here are some example uh, links below. Uh, and the, the image here on the lower right is, is a forecast map room page from, uh, from Senegal. So you, the, the field that's plotted is the projected uh, expected median rainfall. And then the, the other figure is the probability of exceedance. Um, so the, the rainfall values are on the, um, on the x-axis, and the probability of exceedance is on the y. And there, there are lines for the forecast and the, um, and the historical. So to move on to uh, some adaptation approaches, uh, one of the financial adaptation approaches that's been pursued in this space is index insurance. And the idea with index insurance is to develop an insurance contract that's based on a geophysical index rather than a, a loss that someone then files a claim over. Uh, and the, the advantage uh, to index insurance is that it can have a lower transaction cost. It can lead to faster payouts. And in, uh, in the global south, where there isn't as much uh, sort of policy infrastructure for, index in, for, for insurance, uh, this can serve potentially a larger population, especially with regard to drought risk. Um, and it can help farmers in, in very vulnerable environments sort of reduce the poverty trap and, and um, mitigate some of their losses in the, the most challenging settings. Um, but there are some limitations and constraints with data, with the institutional and regulatory environment, with the need for raising trust and awareness. And not every year that has a, a bad yield will necessarily be captured by an index that's chosen. You, you try to get as good a match as you can, but nothing's going to be perfect. Um, so that, that creates you know, some challenges um, for, for trust and, and implementation year after year. Uh, at the global scale, there's uh, an initiative with the World Bank called the World Bank Global Index Insurance Facility. Uh, and over the last 10, 15 years or so, the, the figure is on the bottom right. Um, <clears throat> there have been about uh, there have been over 10 million contracts with over 60 million beneficiaries and, and about 2 billion, which is, you know, it's a start. It's in the, in, in the context of the global need, it's, it certainly doesn't address the global need. But uh, it's 
it's, it's under development. Some of the major reinsurance companies uh, like Swiss Re and Munich Re are also active in this, in this space. There have been a lot of pilot projects and national scale projects, um, but it's, it's one of the, the approaches that's been pursued. But of course, as the risk or the frequency of extreme events changes, that changes the calculation of, of the pricing and the coverage. So that's something that's sort of constantly uh, evolving. Um, and one of the major challenges uh, going forward is to, to design index insurance projects that can be more sustainable and, and yield better adaptation results in the long run. So there's some research to the effect of bundling index insurance contracts with climate smart agriculture or with other loans to help sort of improve uh, resilience over the long run. And the last topic I'd like to, to talk about is uh, this uh, forecast-based financing initiative. Um, so a number of humanitarian organizations, uh, a number of humanitarian organizations that want to respond to famine and other food security crises um, have historically had sort of a, a reactive model. Um, you know, the event happens and, and then they have to scramble for donor funding and, and start engaging, um, you know, midway through the disaster or after it's already taken shape. Um, with skillful forecasts, it's possible to sort of change that paradigm and move to a more anticipatory approach, and that can help you know, save lives, reduce livelihood impacts, and help the humanitarian organizations use their money uh, more effectively and efficiently. Um, so one of the projects that I was involved with um, was sponsored by the World Food Program, and in the West African country of Niger, which borders in Burkina, um, there was actually a, um, a payout in 2022 of about $10 million in response to uh, a severe early season drought. And um, the, the map on the map room page here, uh, excerpted on the, the bottom right, is from that, from that project. Um, at the global scale, there's uh, a disaster risk uh, or disaster response emergency fund that has been involved in uh, this kind of humanitarian work and has allocated over $500 million uh, to disasters around the world. They're also very interested in trying to move towards this more anticipatory framework. Um, and, and that's one of the major initiatives in this space. Uh, and with that, thank you. Um, this last slide is, I have a lot of links uh, to different projects. Um, and if anyone would like to see my presentation or uh, you know, go to those links or contact me, I'd be happy to follow up. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for giving that perspective on kind of the financing and the cost of this adaptation, especially here in, or excuse me, especially in the Global South. Our final presentation today is from Dr. Paris Collinsworth. Dr. Collinsworth is affiliated with Illinois Sea Grant, where his research focuses on the effects of anthropogenic stressors on food web interactions and fish population dynamics in freshwater ecosystems, with a particular emphasis on the Laurentian Great Lakes of North America. Please welcome Dr. Collinsworth. Worth to the podium. Uh, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. And as you can tell from that introduction, uh, my presentation is going to be a little uh, different than, than the last three. Uh, we're going to focus more. Uh, on regional impacts of climate change uh, with an emphasis here uh, on the Great Lakes. So uh, the Laurentian Great Lakes of North America are one of the most valuable natural resources on the globe, uh, in the globe. The, the shaded area here, this is the, uh, the watershed that encompasses uh, the Laurentian Great Lakes. Um, the Great Lakes provide a lot of ecosystem services uh, for this region. Uh, for example, uh, we talked a bit about agriculture. The, the bread box, the area that they call the bread box of Canada, is uh, in the watershed of the Laurentian Great Lakes. And the, um, the ecosystem of the Great Lakes, the, the environment that they, they provide, help support a lot of agriculture uh, throughout the watershed. Um, as I have here on the slide, um, the Laurentian Great Lakes watershed is home to about 30 million people in the United States and Canada. And um, uh, most of those people are getting their water, you know, pretty much directly from the Great Lakes. 
um, the Great Lakes houses, you know, the cities of like Chicago, uh, Detroit, uh, Toronto. Uh, so there are a lot of people uh, that rely on the ecosystem services that are provided by the Great Lakes. Um, the Great Lakes are also an important economic engine uh, for the region, again, based on those ecosystem services. Uh, tourism is one of the more important um, economic activities in the region uh, associated with the Great Lakes. About uh, 20 million people visit the area. Uh, that generates a lot of money for this region. So about $3.2 million billion um, are associated with tourism in the Great Lakes. Uh, one of the things that I want to fo focus on, another uh, one of the ecosystem services that the Great Lakes provide are the fisheries. Uh, so just in Lake Michigan, uh, the, the economic value of the fishery in Lake Michigan is valued at about $2 billion a year. And so most of that money, though, is generated from recreational fisheries. It's about people going out and taking charter boats and going and catching salmon out in Lake Michigan and all the other lakes are, are, are is similar like that. Uh, but there are there is commercial fishing uh, that happens in the Great Lakes. Uh, I have a couple uh, pictures here. There's. Um, here on the right, this is uh, a more of a, what you traditionally think about with the commercial fishing in the Great Lakes. Uh, a lot of like small family owned uh, fisheries uh, that sort of keep their fishing licenses through generations are out there catching, catching fish. Um, but on the left, there's uh, something I really wanna make sure that this is important because there's a lot of, um, the Native Americans have treaty rights to the Great Lakes. So back in the 1800s, when Native Americans were negotiating, they gave up the land so that they could have access to the fish in the lakes. And so this is a really important, you know, cultural thing for them, um, subsistence fisheries, but also uh, they do make money doing commercial fishing in the Great Lakes. Uh, so. The fisheries in the Great Lakes, though, are primarily focused on uh, native species. And I'll get to that sort of at the end because the native species are the species that are going to be most susceptible to climate change. Uh, but if we're thinking about climate change uh, in this very specific region, uh, it's important to sort of get an idea about what we can expect. Like, what are the things uh, that, that climate change is going to bring for the Great Lakes? And so a lot of the talk was about these global models, um, but what I'm gonna talk about is a, uh, a regional downscaled model. Um, so I work with people where we can take those global climate models and then just sort of force them into a, a local region and get projections about how things are gonna change uh, due to climate change in our area. And so just um, these are details, but uh, we could run them under different scenarios. Um, so we could run them under scenarios where things sort of stabilize. We get a, a better um, handle on the emissions uh, that we're having. We sort of stabilize the climate or you can continue to have a high emission scenario as well. So I'm going to show some results that are going to show a couple of different scenarios. Uh, and the, the variables that we're concerned about for things like um, access to water and fisheries are up here. Um, things like uh, the surface temperatures in the Great Lakes, uh, the amount of ice that we get from year to year, and also uh, precipitation patterns in the regions, in the region. So uh, what do the climate models tell us? So not surprising, uh, they tell us that water temperatures are going to increase. Um, they're increasing um, kind of regardless of the emission scenarios that we use. And, uh, but the, the temporal patterns are sort of um, consistent regardless of what, um, what emission scenarios we, we use. Um, one of the important things is that, that increasing water temperatures is going to change how the lakes stratify. Um, so the, the lakes will stratify seasonally based on warming of the water and then the, the gradients and density of the water at different temperatures. Uh, but the important takeaway here, I want you to focus on the first or the second and the fourth of the color graphs. So these are basically, it's temperature throughout the water column at depth. And there's two important things to point out here. Uh, if you see the first uh, graph and the third graph, you see on the left side, you see those dark blue areas. 
that's basically showing ice. That's that stratification during the winter. So that's ice patterns. And historically we have ice. So that's what that's showing in that first, the first and third. But then the second and fourth, what you're showing, those are the climate change scenarios. So we're actually, we're, we're seeing less ice uh, projected into the future in the Great Lakes. The other thing in, then is these, the red bands at the top. That's the warm surface water. And so uh, with climate change, what we're going to see is we're gonna see an increase in the duration of that stratification period. So we're gonna have warmer water at the surface for a longer period of time. And that has important implications uh, for water quality in the Great Lakes. Um, so again, uh, this is just, now we're just projecting ice cover. So again, what we're projecting is that uh, for the most part under a high emission scenario, most of the Great Lakes are not going to uh, be iced over in the winter. And that is really important uh, for the life history of some of the fish in the Great Lakes. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the coming slides. Um, so then uh, finally, uh, this is not the last one, but uh, precipitation patterns, they're gonna change as well. So essentially what we're expecting is we're expecting more uh, rain to come into the region. And another important part of this is sort of the timing of, the, of when that rain is coming. We're expecting more frequent storms. I think we've already kind of started to see that a bit, uh, but we're expecting to see more storms around this time of the year, like higher uh, precipitation events, higher, higher storm events uh, during the spring. Okay, so that's just essentially what we can expect uh, in, the in a changing climate in the Great Lakes. But then how does that impact uh, the ecosystem services? So thinking first of all about drinkable water. Uh, this is really important. Uh, the lakes are a really important water source for a lot of people. Um, climate change um, will be impacted by the water quality. So increased temperatures, increased storm frequency, that's gonna bring higher temperatures to the water, more nutrients. So the storms are bringing in nutrients uh, off of the watershed. That has, uh, the, has the potential for causing uh, harmful algal blooms. So um, you may have heard back in 2014, uh, the city of Toledo had a no drink, um, they had a no drink warning on their water. There were harmful algal blooms out in Lake Erie that actually cause, um, that actually these algae produce neurotoxins. And then it makes it to where you can't, couldn't drink the water. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were without water for about a week because of harmful algal blooms. That's more likely in a future where we have warmer water, more nutrients in the water. Uh, there's also, uh, so that I have the, this is the Chicago water crib. This is the water intake for Chicago. Um, if these uh, municipalities start to experience these harmful algal blooms, what they're gonna do is they're gonna shift, move their water cribs further offshore, trying to find the cooler water. That actually incurs though a cost, you know, it, it's expensive to move this equipment. And then that's going to increase the, the cost for water in the region, potentially, you know, pricing some people out. Okay, so that's the impacts for the drinkable water. In terms of the fisheries, um, again, we're gonna see increased water temperatures. One thing that the Great Lakes have for them is that they're a pretty, it's a pretty cold ecosystem. And so there's a lot of potential invasive species that got here, uh, but then it was too cold for them to survive. And so as we increase the water temperature, we're increasing the likelihood that those invasive species are gonna come into the ecosystem. And that's really hard to predict in terms of like what's gonna happen when you get an invasive species into the ecosystem. But we've seen over the last century that they can really sort of wreck things. Um, I have here uh, changes in fish distributions. So the fish are able to thermoregulate through their behavior. They're gonna move further offshore. So for those local uh, you know, commercial fishers, they're gonna have to move farther offshore. They're gonna incur costs by going out, uh, having to go further offshore to get their catches. And they're already sort of on, on a very, uh, they're, they're, they're not getting by. They're, they're not, they don't have um, a lot of excess money to sort of put to gas to go farther offshore. 
and then uh, have negative impacts of neg na native species here. Um, the ice cover, as I mentioned, a lot of the native species, they actually lay their eggs in the fall, and then those eggs develop over winter, and then they hatch in the spring. And they actually need that ice so that the eggs aren't you know, being dislodged by winter storms and sort of uh, causing mortality on the eggs as they're being laid in the nearshore areas. Uh, so those native species that the fisheries rely on are very susceptible to the loss of ice in the Great Lakes. Uh, so just finally, some take home points. Uh, Lake Michigan, all of the Great Lakes are really a valuable uh, resource. 20% of the fresh water of the globe is, you know, a couple blocks from here. Um, but climate change is a, it's a persistent threat, but it's not a novel threat to the Great Lakes. It's essentially an interactor with a, the threats that are already there. So for example, climate change makes invasive species more likely to invade. We, we already deal with native invasive species in the Great Lakes. We already deal with water quality issues. Uh, but climate change will certainly make these things worse. And then that should provide extra motivation to deal with these current stressors that exist in the Great Lakes. And so thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Collingsworth, for bringing us a little bit more regional from a global to a regional perspective here. Um, I do want to encourage everyone that is standing in the back. There are some seats right here. They say reserved seats. Take them, right? We're going to have a conversation now. Um, if anyone sees an open seat next to them, maybe let somebody know, or if you have a bag, put it on. This is great, right? We want to encourage everyone to be part of the conversation here uh, for this panel. Um, right now, I'm going to bring up Dr. Deb Johnny Goddick, who is going to be helping continue and moderate this panel um, by speaking with our panelists. She's going to probably present a couple questions to get us started before we turn it over to you. And we would love to hear you ask questions to our panelists. So thank you so much. I'm just so excited and um, I mean, to really, really appreciate Alice from a um, This is honestly a very enriching experience for our students, so thank you so much. Um, I would like to start with a couple of questions that, um, you know, that I have uh, for, for panelists here. So I'll just start with um, Jonas. Uh, um, so Jonas, in your research, um, you examined irrigation practices, and Jonas has some fantastic paper from his PhD, um, and he actually showed there are some countries who are kind of in good category of irrigation. Some countries are in kind of bad because they're not efficiently using irrigation system. So that causes, irrigation is very important for the farmers and for the country because it can cause a lot of water waste and that can change the agriculture yield and the productivity. So my kind of question for Jonas, do you have any suggestion for North America, maybe more specific to Midwest and USA as a whole, where we can do some sustainable water management practices or irrigation practices for our farmland? Because water is not something isolated, it is such a kind of like so center to the agriculture system. Great. Uh do you want me to set up or stay yeah, here? Yeah. yeah. All right. I turn it on. Great. That's a fantastic question. Thanks for raising water because I didn't really have time to go into that. You know, it bridges a lot of these aspects we were talking about. One is climate change adaptation. And, you know, water is really fundamental to growing food, but agriculture as it is today is actually the single largest freshwater user, user on the planet, and most of it is unsustainable. At the same time, we need water, especially in the future, under uh, you know, increasing number of heat waves and intensities and uh, uh, higher general warming levels to maintain our productivity. So sustainable water use is one of the key uh, measures to really you know, uh, bring a system uh, into, onto a more resilient pathway and, and make, it, make it future proof. So especially um, on-farm 
uh, water management practices are often overlooked. So it's not just irrigation in you know, a major scheme. You build a dam and then you store all the water and dump it on the field. But really, uh, 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 you know, local solutions on the field that don't require a lot of infrastructure investment are, have extreme, very, very high potential. You know, think of water harvesting from your rooftop. If it's actually raining, most of it is running off. So you can store some of it to bridge dry spells. You can use agroforestry and other cover crops to alleviate soil evaporation. So that's a big measure to combine different crops at the same time to maintain soil moisture uh, and make it actually accessible to the plant. So there's, there's a whole conversation we can have. Um, what else I want to say? Um, uh, okay, so the, the what's specifically important in the U.S. is uh, make it more sustainable. You know, the, in, in in this country, we, we have the, the the resources to to invest in infrastructure, uh, but much of the irrigation is actually happening on a, a non-sustainable basis. So where it's it's groundwater draft, uh, and uh, that needs to put on a more sustainable path. We have a lot of rivers that don't even reach the, the ocean anymore, uh, um, because of that. Um, my head is spinning. I have a lot of other things I wanted to mention. But also, I would like, you know, I don't want to talk forever. So let's, let's see what, what you all uh, have to, to bring into the conversation. So um, thank you, I'll leave it at that. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, you'll get more questions soon. <laughs> OK, I'm going to go to next, um, the second speaker, Elizabeth. Um, so Elizabeth, um, you know, actually spent a lot of her time of life in Burkina Faso, which is uh, located in Africa. And this country has gone, gone through some significant changes in climate, and you probably have seen this in the news. Um, this problem has been aggravated at Burkina Faso uh, due to extreme population pressure and migration, and also poor management of water resources. But they also did something to change the scenario, as Elizabeth pointed out, some of those measures. So the question for Elizabeth is, what barriers do you think are there in accessing and documenting vital climate information from marginalized communities, such as Fulani herders um, that you mentioned, and making it available to the scientific community? Um, that's an, um, that's an excellent question. Um, so I think the major barrier in West Africa is the lack of written records. And most of the time, people who hold indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, are the elderly. And when they pass away, there is no, nobody to take over. Of course, they transmit their knowledge from like to younger people, but not everything can be transmitted orally. So this could be a challenge. Um, another challenge is trust. Um, because when you want to gather information from any community, you need to build trust. And these communities have been marginalized and um, exploited for such a long time that uh, when you are a researcher going into those communities, people are not really open in sharing um, all the information, uh, especially when something is considered as a community secret. And um, I think. Any issue that we experience with communities working with scientists is knowledge translation. Um, it's not a matter of them not speaking English or French, but it's a matter of translating the local indicators into a knowledge that scientists can understand, and also translating scientists' uh, scientific knowledge back into those com in a language that these people can understand. So for example, when I work with herders, um, they have a different, um, um, and they have a different calendar, seasonal calendar, that uh, includes three different seasons and then intermediaries that are based on pastoral and agricultural activities. But for scientists, the region has two seasons. So, but they think that the region has three seasons and intermediaries. So this is, uh, this is something that needs, we have to be on the same page to underst understand each other um, on these very basic issues. Um, and I think that if we want to um, bring um, communities at the same table with scientists, we need interdisciplinary research. And that's why anthropologists are important. That's why historians and linguists are important, social scientists in general, so that they can facilitate that communication. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Your work really is very fascinating when I was reading your paper. And that's why I really need to ask another question. Um, uh, so, you know, we always have something to learn from each other. So what can we learn from the experience of Burkina Faso that we do not want to make the same mistakes? We have do not have the same geography and climate, but we also have grassland. We also have the farmlands. So do you have any message for us? Yes, um, Burkina Faso invested a lot in soil and water conservation, and they didn't just focus on scientific knowledge, they also tried to promote traditional knowledge. So some of the, uh, the adaptations that I showed on the pictures are actually community-based. So I think that any community adaptation measures that can be promoted could be very, um, could be welcomed, I think, everywhere in the world. As long as you involve the community, you listen to people, Make sure that um, what scientists are working on are actually things that people are interested in doing uh, could actually help promote sustainable practices. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move to Asher. Um, so Asher, question for you is how does extreme weather event, and when I'm saying extreme weather event, that could be heat wave, that could be flood, um, things like that. How sometimes people like weather and climate, they're two different things, so people sometimes do not relate them. But how do you um, kind of um, shed some light or that how these events are connected with climate change and how our traditional agricultural practices are vulnerable to such extreme weather. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> um, thanks very much for the, for the question. So yeah, the um, the connection between the the change in the global mean temperature and the extremes is is you know it, it's been understood for a long time, but it's a, it, it's a bit to to unpack. So I mean, the the connection between rising temperatures and uh, increased severity and, and length of, of heat waves is pretty that's pretty intuitive, um, but the the connection to the Hydroclimate extremes. That you know, why, why are we seeing more extreme droughts and floods? Um, there are there are sort of two factors that are part of this. So, warmer air can hold more moisture. There's a, a principle called the Clausius-Clapeyron equation um, that basically tells us that if you increase the temperature of the air by about a degree Celsius, you increase the water holding capacity by something like 5%. It's not strictly linear, but it's you know something along those lines. So as the temperatures increase, the, the air can hold more water, but also as the air in, uh, temperature increases, it requires more water vapor in the air to reach the point where you're going to have rainfall. Um, so there's a there's a potential for greater you know deluges and, and you know major severe storms and we've seen around the world you know increase in in one day extreme rainfall events but also uh, an extreme an increase in extreme droughts and often that that threshold is not met um, there are also changes in the the dynamics of the atmosphere so we've seen um, some more intense convective updrafts that that lead to the the severe storms but then also in other regions we've seen uh, uh, larger scale, you know, broad subsiding uh, motion in, in the atmosphere, which tends to, to suppress rainfall. Um, I actually, on the topic of extremes, I want to mention something connected to Paris's talk. So if we look at the long run, Yes, it's very likely that ice cover in the Great Lakes um, is likely to reduce if you look at like you know, the decade slice of the 2050s as compared to the 1990s or something. But there's also a lot of noise in that data, too. And um, back in, like, 2013 or 2014, there were some really severe cold winters here in, in the eastern two-thirds of the U.S., and a lot of the Great Lakes froze over. And that's one of the other sort of... Um, you know, maybe less intuitive impacts of climate change. So what you have in winter months, typically, you know, you have obviously colder temperatures and high latitudes and, you know, more moderate temperatures and low latitudes, and you have a strong separation um, between the polar air mass and the, the mid-latitude air mass. But as the, um, as the climate changes, the 
overall equator to pole temperature difference uh, is reduced. And so the strength of that jet stream and the strength of that um, sort of barrier, the polar vortex barrier, uh, can weaken. And sometimes really cold air can make its way uh, further south. It's usually, if you look at the long-term statistics, it's not you know, these events are usually not very persistent over extended periods of time, um, but they can, they can cause really severe disruptions and they can lead to anomalous seasons in individual re regions. Um, so, oh, and the other part of the question was about agricultural adaptation. Uh, well, I think, I mean, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about different types of adaptations, like um, what, what uh, Lisa was mentioning in, in the West African Sahel. We saw a lot of great examples from the, um, from the keynote address last night. Um, and to the point about um, using water more sustainably in the US, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of unsustainable water practice in like the Ogallala aquifer area in, in the Great Plains and in the, the, the Central Valley and Imperial Valleys in California. A lot of the agriculture throughout the US is, you know, large scale application of water to a field and the, the evaporative losses are just huge um, by proportion. So if if there's an effort to do, you know, targeted drip irrigation, I think in one of the slides from the keynote last night, there was, there was talk about a drone application of irrigation and also fertilizers or, and or herbicides. You can, you can accomplish many of the same objectives that you want for your crops, you know, in terms of getting them enough water, in terms of getting, you know, eliminating pests, giving them the nutrients they need with a much, much smaller uh, ecological food footprint if you use some of these <clears throat> more, you know, advanced technologies that are coming onto line. There are cost issues, obviously, and, you know, it, it's going to require investment and, and um, policy to support those measures, but I think that's a, that's a way to approach the future. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. My last question for Paris is, uh, Paris, so our kind of projection for the Midwest um, uh, national climate assessment for us is that we're going to get some higher number of days with heavy precipitation over here. So that may sound that a good news, but it's not good news, maybe. Depends on the timing. Um, so um, what is the impact of this accelerated hydrologic cycle, as we call it, the climate science, uh, on the Great Lakes and the connected river? Okay, thank you. Um, excellent question. Um, I didn't really, 10 minutes goes really fast when you're up here talking, so I didn't get, it, get everything I wanted to. But in one of those slides um, that I put up there about precipitation, uh, one of the more robust sort of projections is that those storm events will happen at a specific time. So sort of in the spring, um, in, yeah, in the spring here in the Midwest, um, that is, uh, for the Great, in terms of the Great Lakes, uh, it is problematic. Uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, the first is that there's the, that's a time when farmers are tending to put fertilizer out in their fields. Uh, so whether it's in Canada, they put a lot of manure on the fields. Here in the United States, we tend to just put phosphorus fertilizer uh, on fields. Uh, it's also a time when there's not any sort of biological activity in those fields. You know, the, the crops aren't growing. And so these large rain events can come in and just sort of sweep everything off into the rivers, essentially making its way uh, into the Great Lakes. And so uh, in the Great Lakes, phosphorus is the, the limiting nutrient for algal production. So that gets out there in the lakes and it really increases uh, the capacity for those algal blooms. Um, and then you know, through the season, as the water temperatures warm, the, the competition between those algal communities sort of shifts to where you have less of the kind of beneficial, because algae, you know, it's the basic food web. It's ultimately, you know, kind of working its way into the fish. But as you, as the water temperature warms, as those initial phosphorus levels sort of go down, you shift the community into uh, one that's more likely to be towards these harmful algal blooms. Um, and the, those types of like microcystis, which, microcystis, which it produces uh, neurotoxins and potential water quality impairments. Thank you, Paris. Okay, now we're going to open the floor for questions. So, um, please.
please take this opportunity to ask the panels any question you may have. Okay, for, for, for John and Elizabeth, have you, both of you ever looked at alternative crops that could survive in, in the lower latitude that could, uh, could tolerate a higher level of climate variation? Yes, we go first if you want. Okay, no, thanks for raising that. That's a very important question, and yes, of course. Um, that's the miracle, you know, that's the big question. How, how far can a breeding go? What, what kind of cultivars do we already have? What kind of cultivars could we come up with that potentially be the silver bullet to solve this all? Uh, I don't want to bank on that. But um, we are currently running projects where we try to evaluate what we call opportunity crops or forgotten crops or sometimes people call orphan crops. You know, crops that are traditionally planted and are not among the major four cereal crops because they, all of the research went into maize and wheat to create these high yielding hybrid varieties that are not meant to be resilient, they're meant to be high yielding. So there's a lot to be said on um, you know, promoting, um, developing, and planting and disseminating uh, alternative crops. Um, there is potential, but I don't think it's going to be the solution to uh, climate change altogether. Um, to that, I would like to add that actually in Burkina Faso, people are already using improved varieties of crops such as sorghum, um, millet, uh, corn. And in some parts of the country, this is the only thing they can use nowadays. So it's already happening. I see the that the stupids have already won. We're not going to hit the various climate goals. We aren't. There's lagging. They make prom the promises have been made, and we're not hitting those promises. We had a crisis like this in the 1930s. It's probably not even as big, but we did have a crisis, and the res the answer was the New Deal, and now we need another deal, and. Because the stupids have already won, I don't see the possibility that the Congress, the government, will rise to the ability to deal with the amount of interest, infrastructure that will be required to replace the problems that are going to come from climate change. They are just not going to want to spend the money. And so the stupids have already won. And I'm interested in a comment from each one of you. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, sure. I, I can kick us off. I, I don't want to get uh, you know too hung up on defining the stupid. But uh, um, so we haven't talked about decarbonizing the food system. I mentioned it as, as one of as the big challenges when I started giving my remarks, um, but it's Im really important to bring it up because the food system, agricultural productivity and the food system in general is the single hardest sector to decarbonize. Um, you know, it's not like ground transportation, you electrify, you generate electricity with renewables, done. Right, simple theory, hard to implement, but it's pretty straightforward. Agriculture and the food system don't work like that. You know, it's fragmented, it's highly regional, it's highly local. You have different sources, livestock, you have emissions from uh, fertilizer applications, land clearing, then you have all the production, uh, uh, processing, transportation, food waste. All of that is a really non-trivial challenge. There is little hopes everywhere, um, and I stop here and, and see what others have to say. Um, but the overarching umbrella, the, the biggest lever we have is our meat consumption, red meat consumption. 
uh, especially beef. So beef, ha beef consumption has the single largest environmental footprint. And if we all wanted to change something from our side, that's not the solution to it all. There needs to be systemic solutions too. But if there's one thing you can do as an individual is scaling down your red meat consumption because there's cascading effects through the whole life cycle of uh, uh, eating your calories and proteins through red meat. I like cereal. Okay. I'm allergic to pork and beef. Um, can we get some questions from student? Um, getting in front of you. Hi. Um, so I noticed that a lot of you discussed computer models and how simulating climate effects will show in the future. Um, do you, like the people who use computer models, do you believe that computer models are, and simulations are one of our best chances at just sort of figuring out what the climate effects are in the future? And even if they are, what are other options we can look at for communities that don't really have um, um, accessibility to these, inter like the internet, like you said, for Burkina Faso and some of them, and the communities that don't truly understand computer models, are there other options we can look at? Uh, I, I can respond to this. So yeah, it's a great question, and it's really important, um, I think, in all of our work. But certainly at the IRI, uh, Elizabeth and, and I were involved in um, you know, the, the organization is designed to be interdisciplinary for this reason. Um, so we need, we need a solid foundation in science, and the, the climate system is very complex, and the governing equations you know, are, are best modeled through, through sophisticated computer programs, and, and you know, that's how we make seasonal forecasts as well. But it's very important in all of this work to, to translate both the content um, and also just the presentation to the people who who are going to be affected. Um, so, uh, a project that I was involved in with earlier in in Rwanda um, ultimately reached, I think, something like a million or so of the farmers uh, out of a population of about 12 million with improved um, agricultural inform climate and agricultural information, and that was done through a network of extension agents. So. I and a few other people at IRI worked with the, the meteorological service. The meteorological service produced the forecast. They drove to the different parts of the, the country, shared the forecast, and then they worked also with a, a network of extension agents. In the US, there, there are also extension services. The agriculture infrastructure is obviously different, and, and there aren't some of the same you know, infrastructure or language barriers, but it's it's very important that in anything that's you know climate services oriented, um, that there are multiple pathways of conveying the information, of translating the scientific concepts to actionable ideas. So the like the the forecast information we tried to frame as. Um, you know, the probability of exceedance of a threshold that's relevant to an individual farmer. Like an individual farmer may not care about the whole storyline, but they know, you know, they need 300 millimeters of uh, wheat uh, of rainfall to have a successful wheat harvest in this season. So they can go into these map rooms and they can try to find that information. But then also with this sort of engagement with the extension services, it, that that helps extend the network. But it's something that con needs constant attention and funding, and it's it, it is a challenge uh, across the field in climate services. I, I don't know if others want to add. Okay, um, I would like to add that to what Asher just said. Um, so they are also. Um, like a lot of experts in these countries. Um, so it's not just experts from the global north, but there are a lot of people starting to be involved as well, understand these models. And uh, along, for example, with IRI, IRI collaborates with these experts in country. Um, so they know the, the, the reality, like what is happening on the ground and all these things before actually creating these models that are suitable for specific locations. And once the models are ready, it's not what we presented here that people actually see on the ground. 
So for example, for a farmer, if you show that map to a farmer, they won't understand anything. So the knowledge is translated in a way that they can understand. So some of them, for example, receive text messages or like uh, phone calls um, so they can understand in the local language what that means for their, uh, for agriculture, what does this information mean for pastoralism, for example. So this, this is how the information is translated on the ground so people can use it. I'd just like to, um, I could the Asher uh, brought up extension. Um, and I, I work for a group uh, called Sea Grant. And Sea Grant, that is explicitly what we exist for, is to try to uh, translate you know, science to the general public, to anybody who's interested in the resources. The Sea Grant side, where we can uh, focus on aquatics. Uh, but I actually got an email today and I were working on visualizations to try to take those climate models that I talked about in this presentation and, and make them into you know these slick little sort of one page sort of things that we can we can talk about how a changing climate will impact currents in the Great Lakes and what that means for property owners and things like that. So it's an important part of um, of the Sea Grant mission. Also, that's, and that's a direct derivative of land grant universities in the United States and what they do for agriculture as well. There was a question. And while we bring up the mic, just want to say that pretty much all of our projects that are happening in the Global South, we do have a knowledge transfer component. And rather than telling people what to do, we train local teams how to use the models, actually, because that goes a much longer way than, yeah. Hi, um, thank you all for being here and uh, for the great talks. Um, you guys kind of touched on it a little bit here and there in, um, in the, the, the Q&A period. Um, oh, I, I was wondering about regenerative farming and if, uh, if somehow miracles of miracles, uh, those in power, um, uh, they made the right decisions and we were able to move to regenerative farming in the United States and, and, and the rest of the world um, at pace. Um, what kind of effect would that have on the things that, the, the outcomes you guys are talking about? I, I can respond, but Dean. Um, yeah, I, don't, I think top level response here is that there's two challenges. You know, one is we need to make agricultural production sustainable. At the same time, we need to meet our targets of producing food and increasing food production and meeting the you know ever increasing demand and higher quality foods all over the world, not just in the U.S. Right, uh, develop, uh, developing countries are really catching up in their demand. I think, especially with meat consumption. Um, there's a lot that can be done. Think, for example, of uh, um, um, tillage systems, uh, farming systems in the U.S. are actually catching up with the idea that less tillage can actually be a win-win situation. You know, you do conserv uh, 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 conservative tillage systems, or even a no-tillage system, um, where you don't plow the field and, and retain soil moisture and use cover crops instead, these kind of things, um, are catching up. Um, the, the miracle idea of having this beautifully sustainable system that feeds us all uh, is yet t to be devised. So. I think we should all put a lot of strength into trying to make systems more sustainable, but keeping in mind that we all need to eat. And that's that's the fundamental problem I see. Um, so um, I will talk about the Sahel because that's that's um, that's the region I know the most. Um, so when I talked about soil and water conservation, that was very broad, but assisted natural regeneration is part of that. So instead of having farmers cut all the trees on their farm in order to grow crops, what is being done is to leave some of these trees because they, they, some of them are food trees that they can use for their subsistence. So this is an example of what people are doing um, in order to um, just leave the tree on your plant, like just leave some of the trees on your farm so that they can also provide some type of food for you instead of just growing crops. So this is just one basic example of what is being done in that region. 
and, and trees on a farm can also help um, break up, you know, wind currents and, you know, reduce reduce those challenges. Um, I think, I mean, I, I can't make overgeneralizations, but I think, um, you know, one of the, the, you know, parcels of hope in, in the otherwise bleak picture is that a lot of evidence with both regenerative agriculture and also with ecosystems shows that the, the natural systems are actually, as sensitive as they are, they're also relatively resilient if, and, and they can bounce back if you change practices relatively quickly. Um, I mean, there, there are a lot of practices that need to change and they're, they're huge, as we've all mentioned, you know, they're, they're huge emissions that are associated with with the agricultural industry as it as it exists but you know with practices like intercropping no-till agriculture um you know other 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 more sustainable processes i think it is possible to have a, a really significant impact on the carbon budget and to still meet many of the the food needs i mean we can't be as the the keynote speaker said last night we we can't do everything local organic we just we have too much food demand um but there are a lot of ways between a marriage of older or indigenous or or you know historical knowledge and modern technology there are ways to to chart a path forward um, there are a lot of challenges, of course, with the stupids and <laughs> with, the, with the the political structure that that exists and is in place. But that's where you know that's where we all have to play a role in who we vote for, what we push for at a local level, even if we can't you know change Congress and magically make it function. Um, <laughs> you know, we can we can still do things at a local level, and and we can engage with the problem in, through our own communities. management practices for farmers and essentially all that is is you know for the most part slowing water down and, and keeping it from just running right off the fields and running into the lakes and so there's a, a, an additional benefit uh, that comes from this as well and that would be the last question unfortunately from the panel um, for the panel this is a lot of pressure um, <laughs> um, a few of you touched on a major pest invasion that happened I don't exactly remember where, but what are some ways that we can work in the Great Lakes region or around here to make sure that pest invasions um, aren't a huge threat without like GMOs, without like polycultures? What are some ways that we can help that? So I can talk specifically, you know, about the, the Great Lakes, um, and there are uh, there as of right now there are a lot of programs that are sort of established. Uh, in, in terms of dealing with, with invasive species, which is you know sort of sort of what I deal with, and um, so one of the major ways that invasive species can get into the lakes is through intercontinental shipping, and um, they actually sort of hitchhike on uh, in, in ships in, in ballast water, uh, and so there are a lot of programs now where we, we didn't even know that that was necessarily a problem, you know, say you know 50 years ago. Uh, and now we're dealing with everybody's familiar with like zebra mussels or quagga mussels. And so that's how those things get here. Um, there have been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of research into how to sort of keep that from happening in the future. Um, and, and a lot of it deals with, you know, just common sense sort of sanitation and sterilization things that, that we didn't think of, um, you know, back in back 50 to 60 years ago. Um, there's also the, um, I'm sure you guys have all seen the carp uh, that are sort of right at our doorstep. Um, and, and right now there's a huge uh, program uh, maintaining like electrical barriers uh, in the Chicago uh, shipping canal uh, to sort of make sure that, that things are coming in into the Great Lakes that, that we don't want. Um, so in terms of invasive species, there are a lot of, you know, just basic monitoring programs and, and just trying to get a handle on, you know, what's coming in and what's coming out. Um, but I'll let 
it, it, I don't know much about pests in, in agricultural systems. I could add just a little bit more. Um, not so much for the Great Lakes, but I mean, it's it's what a, climate and health is another major intersection point, and and we've seen around the world um, that climate stressors are are having impacts on the range of different diseases. Um, some work that I was involved with recently was on malaria uh, risk in in Ethiopia as a function of climate change and, and El Nino. Um, there are certain epidemics or pest invasions that are going to be extremely difficult to prevent or control and, and even you know the algal blooms I mean when the water temperature gets to a certain point I mean you can't you can't prevent the algae from growing anywhere in the Great Lakes. So in some cases, the best you can do is have a, like a forecasting or monitoring framework in place and you know, try to respond to the emergent risk in a timely manner. For other things, you know, if you know about the, the, <laughs> the, the mussels you know, riding the ballast water, then you can, you can take more preventative action. But I think just having a dialogue between the, the climate science community and public health officials and understanding those interlinkages so that there's there's a, an adaptive response. Um, we also see that with just heat health you know issues. I mean there there's so many people in the US and, and around the world who have who have died or who've been made much sicker because of heat stress, uh, you know, especially if they had pre existing um, cardiovascular challenges. So so just having good, you know, a good linkage between the, the climate science community and the public health, and understanding what some of those linkage points are is, will you know, if we if we can do that as a society, then we can make steps towards at least mitigating um, some of the major some of the major pest invasions or some of the major disease and public health burdens that we're likely to face. So thank you all for being here with us this morning to make this panel extremely successful and like really enlightening for us. Um, so please, um, I would like to know that we have two uh, panels coming up, one at 11 a.m. and another at 2 p.m. Those will be more on climate change and food system over Midwest. And the last one is uh, the food justice in Chicago. So those two will be very, very interesting as well. So please enjoy a quick break, fill up the coffee cup, and um, check out the exhibit hall. That's the next door. And there, our students will be presenting as well, poster, and there will be a lot of interesting tables. So we'll see you guys very soon at 11 a.m. I'm sorry that we're a little over the time. <laughs>